I want breakfast. Oh, sorry. I was daydreaming again. Seriously, I gotta stop spacing out like that. You know who this reminds me of? My childhood friend, Sayori. She's always doing that. But I love that girl, even if she is a total airhead. From her bubbly and joyous disposition, to her unbridled kindness, to her lack of self-love and trying to ignore it by being the sunshine for everyone else around her. Oh, that one's not so good, actually. I guess we have a lot more to talk about. I already committed to writing about her, so I guess I'll just have to accept the revolution! Hey! You look nice today. I'm Juice. Oh, hold on. I, I have to take this. Yes, I know I forgot the mod meeting. Ugh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I'm a dummy. I get it. Yep. I'm Juice. And welcome to my character analysis of Sayori, the vice president of the literature club who's honestly just as forgetful as I am. But how does it feel to get called out for this sort of stuff all the time? How many happy thoughts and bottles do we have to pluck from our brains before it stops? That's what we're going to be talking about today. But first, let's give Sayori some love, shall we? She deserves it. Comment below all the things you love about her. For each compliment, she gets a cookie. And you know how much she loves those. But okay, I guess we should stop procrastinating and open the script. Gently. Sayori's a bundle of sunshine, but once we unwrap that crooked little bow of hers, we see there's much more to her than how she presents herself to others. With sunshine comes rainbows, but eventually rain clouds too. Sayori suffers from depression. We know this not only because she tells us directly when we visit our house, but because there are hints leading up to it consistently in the writing. First thing we notice is her sprites are much different from any of the other girls. Let's start with her coral pink hair. It's noticeably messy and we later learn that she cut it short because she couldn't take care of it. On top of that, her blazer is unbuttoned, and her collar all ruffled up too. Oh, and don't forget that toothpaste stain and crooked bow. Leave it to Mr. Main Character to bluntly point that one out. So, it seems like Sayori isn't very good at taking care of herself. She's always oversleeping and then rushing to get things done later when the adrenaline kicks in because she knows she has responsibilities, even if she thinks there's no point. Here, let's take a look at Dear Sunshine, the first of Sayori's poems we get to read. This poem talks about finding the motivation to get out of bed in the morning. Let's take a look at the last few lines. If it wasn't for you, I could sleep forever. Referring to the sunshine, she's saying if there wasn't anything for her to wake up to, she would probably sleep forever. Either she's just sleeping in, or she means it metaphorically. Most likely both. The sunshine is likely referring to us, who's waiting outside for her so we can walk to school together. We're her motivation. But I'm not mad. I want breakfast. That line may be as clumsy as Sayori, but it shows how much of a rush she's in in the morning. The adrenaline finally pushing her to get the thing she needs to get done, done. As uh, she was probably finishing up the poem and breakfast that morning. After all, you wouldn't want to have to deal with that shame you feel when someone asks you where that poem is and you don't have it. And then there's bottles, which I'll have Sayori read as I talk about it. I pop off my scalp like the lid of a cookie jar. It's the secret place where I keep all my dreams. Little balls of sunshine, all rubbing together like a bundle of kittens. The first stanza establishes that she reaches into her head to find her happy thoughts. She has those happy thoughts ready, like ammunition to make your friends feel better. My collection makes me lots of friends. Each bottle a starlight to make amends. Sometimes my friend feels a certain way. Down comes a bottle to save the day. This one shows that they're possibly the reason why she has friends in the first place, and that reinforces that she's happy, or pretending to be, for the purpose of other people, not herself. Night after night, more dreams. Friend after friend, more bottles. Deeper and deeper my fingers go, like exploring a dark cave, discovering the secrets hiding in the nooks and crannies. Digging and digging, scraping and scraping. She's beginning to scrape the bottom of the barrel for those happy thoughts, and she's coming up empty. She's being run dry. There's nothing left for herself, and the words used here paint a seriously painful picture. Digging and digging, scraping and scraping. Finally, all done. I open up, and in come my friends. In they come in such a hurry. Do they want my bottles that much? I frantically pull them from the shelf, one after the other, holding them out to each and every friend. 
each and every bottle. But every time I let one go, it shatters against the tile between my feet. Happy thoughts, happy thoughts, happy thoughts in shards all over the floor. They were supposed to be for my friends, my friends who aren't smiling. They're all shouting, pleading, something. But all I hear is echo, 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 echo inside my head. The final stanza describes the pressure she puts on herself for her friends. What is she if she's not at her best? Her fears have come true. She's tired of being there for her friends when she didn't have the energy to, and put too much pressure on herself to make them feel okay. Meanwhile, those happy thoughts and bottles aren't being sent back. Now, she doesn't hear them anymore, leaving nothing but the depression to talk to her in her alone time, symbolized clearly by the echoes. But seriously, we don't know where her depression comes from, whether it's past events or a chemical imbalance, but some of the symptoms that aren't talked about as often are as follows. Trouble with thinking, difficulty concentrating, trouble with making decisions, and trouble with remembering things. These symptoms are also textbook for someone who suffers from ADHD, or Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Now, I'm not saying Sayori necessarily has ADHD, but I never see this angle brought up, probably because it's not directly confirmed. Regardless, I want to talk about how the symptoms shared between the two could explain what Sayori is going through, the connections between the two disorders, and how feasible it is that Sayori might have it. Professionals say ADHD and depression can be comorbid, which means you can have both at the same time. And statistics show that 30% of children who have ADHD also have mood disorders like depression. There are even some statistics out there that say more than half of people who have ADHD will get treated for depression at some point in their lives. Take that in for a second. Yeah. Now, while I could sit here all day and continue to talk about the connections, the thing I want to focus on the most is the possibility that the depressive thought she has comes as a result of the symptoms the two conditions share. For example, waking up late or not being able to do things that most people can do without effort can lead to feelings of self-doubt and worthlessness. It can make you feel like there's something seriously wrong with you and you end up getting down on yourself for things that are largely outside of your control. Everyone else pointing and laughing or not fully understanding your situation can feel alienating, and it ends up being self-deprecating over time. Once people call you stupid and unreliable enough, you start to believe it. Sooner or later, you'll be calling yourself stupid when you make those mistakes. It becomes a black and white mentality. If this, then that. And that mindset is the exact opposite of truth. It leaves no room for nuance. And you need to be patient and understanding with yourself to finally conquer those negative thought patterns. Compounding too many of those thoughts can lead yourself to believe that the world might be better off without you. If you weren't such a hassle. If people didn't have to worry about you so much. If people didn't have to pick up your slack. But let me tell you right now, that is never true. When I first played Doki Doki Literature Club, I didn't exactly make the connections that I'm making right now. But the reason why this topic and Sayori mean so much to me I've been through this myself. These same thought patterns, mentalities, and issues surrounding self-worth. They don't come out of nowhere. It's all years of conditioning from growing up in a society who doesn't cater to those who suffer from these conditions. It all eventually culminates into the mentality that you must be the problem. Instead of the simple fact that the way our brains work is just as valuable as everyone else's, it's just different. Everyone has their strengths and weaknesses. We should be kinder to ourselves and rationalize our mistakes instead of thinking in absolutes. Sometimes, we need to read our own bottles full of happy thoughts. Looking back to the poem we analyzed earlier, she's covering up how she feels with her cheery disposition. That's because she doesn't want anyone else to worry about her. But we do end up worrying about her once her depression starts seeping through the cracks. And the reason why what happens with Sayori is so effective is because it's a subversion of the common Genki girl trope which can be described as the personality of a character who is very energetic, excitable, and filled with confidence and determination, whether she is competent or not. And those aren't my words. Sayori is obviously very smart in ways that most people aren't. You can see various examples throughout the game where she tells other people what they're feeling. She's super emotionally intelligent. She knows what's up. But you can read all about the Genki girl trope on Tropopedia, which yes, 
exists, I guess. I will give the website credit, though. It says Genki Girls will be symbolized by sunflowers, which happens to be on this official Sayori shirt I have on here. Ooh, and it's sky blue, like her eyes. <laughs> but anyways, Dan Salvato, the creator of the game, did this specifically to impact the player more. And the fact that it speaks much more to real life is certainly an accomplishment, seeing how this game was made to make fun of these tropes in the first place. He's gone on record saying the characters of this game are inspired by people from real life. So kudos to you, sir. You did a great job. Another example of Sayori covering up her depression is in the poem Become the Flower, which is shown when Monica finds Sayori's folder that she left behind in the side story Trust. This poem is largely the same as the Bottles poem from earlier, just with a few things shifted around. She says the feeling of joy is a flower plucked from the ground, but the field of flowers is finite, clearly represented by the prosperous field turning into a barren wasteland, the wasteland symbolizing her heart and joy left for herself. She's so busy making everyone else feel better by putting up a front that she leaves nothing for herself. And so, she's decided that she must become the flower, meaning she needs to become a radiant light for herself and for others. By being that light for others, Sayori shows a lot of emotional maturity, being a mediator of sorts, which is probably due to her going through as much as she has. When people have deep emotional struggles, they tend to mature in ways that other people don't until later in life, while at the same time stunting their growth in a lot of other areas. They're able to give perspective on problems they've gone through themselves, being able to spot those problems in others because they've had to think about it so much when sitting in their own feelings. It can really make them want to learn more about themselves in the mental health epidemic the world faces. Not like the educational system is going to teach people that. <sighs> However, while helping your friends through their mental struggles can be done with good intentions, and it is important for them to have someone to talk to, try to recognize when you're overstepping your boundaries or start talking about things you have little knowledge on. We're not experts, and sometimes this can lead to downplaying the experiences of those who need serious help. We don't want to discourage people who are experiencing their struggles from opening up about them and cause self-doubt in their assessment of their mental state. When talking to your friends who you believe need help, ask questions about their feelings and what they're going through. Give them autonomy in the conversation instead of telling them what's wrong with them. We don't want to diagnose people based off cliches and normalize that misinformation. For example, just because someone's having a bad day doesn't mean they're clinically depressed. And just because things may not seem bad on the outside doesn't mean that person isn't struggling either. The most important thing to remember is mental illness as a whole is very nuanced. There's a lot of gray area. The depictions we see in media aren't always accurate, and there's no light to be made of someone's struggles. The romanticism around mental illness is not okay, and it needs to stop. Sorry, I guess I just needed to get that off my chest. Why don't we go through a few examples of Sayori helping her friends through their emotional struggles to see what I'm talking about. In the side story, Understanding, Sayori is easily able to guide Yuri through her breakdown, saying that she understands what Yuri is feeling and the things she's saying are different. She's able to guide Yuri through her feelings with warmth and a true sense of understanding. And then in the side story, Reflection, Natsuki says she thinks it's better to just pretend things didn't happen than to sit there and worry about them all the time. But Sayori explains that for some people, it's really hard to cope when you get a bad thought in your head. You can distract yourself for a while, but as soon as it's just you and your thoughts again, it comes back. It's okay to have feelings. It doesn't make you weak. Then she goes through Natsuki's feelings with her, reminding her that you're not your feelings. Our thoughts and feelings are two different things. Even if we don't like our feelings, we have to understand them if we want to learn more about ourselves. We have to accept the things we don't like if we want to grow from them. The way she likes to picture it is that those feelings are like her roommate. You live in the same house and you gotta see each other every day? And even if you can ignore each other most of the time, you're gonna run into each other every now and then, and it's gonna make you feel like poop. So, the other option is to get to know each other. You can communicate and learn from each other, and maybe even help each other change for the better. Natsuki asks how Sayori knows so much about this kind of stuff, and Sayori answers saying that she happens to have a very hard roommate to get along with, called depression. Now, while she's really good at helping people with their feelings, she's not so good at opening up about herself and taking advice because she doesn't want those people to worry about her. She doesn't want to feel like a burden, it just worsens her depressive symptoms. Probably because making other people happy is one of the few things that helps her. But she still has to get those feelings out somehow, so she does so informatively through her poetry. When she does let her bubbly little mask slip, she gets very upset about other people noticing. 
In the main game, her conversation with us after we hypothesize that something is wrong when she leaves the club early does not go smoothly. She's upset over the fact that she has to tell us she has depression, that we noticed something was wrong. No matter what we say, we can't help her feel any better here. She's stuck in her head, saying if she told us she was depressed, then we would have to waste effort caring about her instead of doing important things. Ugh. As if caring about her isn't important. Not that the protagonist has the best dialogue in this situation. Don't worry, MC. We'll get to you. Also, when Monica reads that Become the Flower poem that we talked about earlier, she becomes extremely concerned for Sayori, going as far as to say that she feels bad for burdening her with her problems, saying the things Sayori goes through are much worse. When Sayori finds out, she says that she wasn't ready to share those poems, and now Monica is worrying about her. She doesn't want that. Monica says that they don't have to talk about it right now, but to promise that when she feels like she's ready, they can. It's the vision to be able to express yourselves in ways you otherwise wouldn't be able to, through literature, right the way into your heart. But the very next day, Sayori confronts Monica with her feelings. She follows Monica's lead in creating poetry from her heart and takes the piece of paper Monica was trying to write on, writing, sometimes I want to die. This is something that Sayori has never told anyone else before. She goes as far as to mention that even now, her head was screaming at her to stop. I have this problem where I get really upset when people worry too much about me. It's like, why waste your energy worrying about me when you can just be happy instead? Her sense of self-worth has gotten to a point where she feels like she's not even worth helping anymore. That it would just be better if people didn't even try. Better for her to keep on smiling and make everyone else around her happy in an attempt to mask the pain. And letting people look inside my head? doesn't bring happiness to anybody. Sayori is constantly looking out for others instead of herself, but her time with the literature club up to this point has shown her that it's okay for her to do that, to be selfish sometimes. I'm worthless. Everyone would be better off without me. I'm just an inconvenience to everyone. I don't want to have these thoughts. I want them to go away. And now I'm making you put up with me and I just want to die! These thoughts, Sayori's true thoughts, come rushing out of her like a kaleidoscope of butterflies being set free from their confinement, spelling out in the air how Sayori truly feels about herself. Her self-worth has plummeted, overwhelmed by her internal thoughts swarming inside her, starting off as innocent little caterpillars, mutated into their cocoon by the disease that is depression. That's why she doesn't want to let them go free. But sometimes, letting those butterflies roam free in the sunshine is just what you need for them to change. But then again, why let anything show when you can be a ladybug instead? Like butterflies, ladybugs are usually seen as positive, especially when compared to other bugs. They have a major role in eating insects that feed on plants, and are seen as a good luck charm if one lands on you. However, Sayori sees herself as anything but a good luck charm. In her Ladybug poem, which is a special event poem unlocked after acquiring all of Sayori's other poems, she wrote about a useless ladybug clinging on to anyone it won't bother. In the first stanza, Sayori describes the ladybug as small and exhausted, much like her own physical state while dealing with depression. The second stanza symbolizes that what Sayori shows on the outside doesn't necessarily equate to how she feels on the inside. Like a cute ladybug, she puts up a front to keep herself afloat so she doesn't get squashed. Though unlike the ladybug, she has to try. And now the third stanza establishes that Sayori is this useless ladybug. The one who clings like a doof onto your sleeve because it knows you won't squash it. If it doesn't bug you, will you stay a while? She wants to make real connections and feel normal, but isn't able to communicate her feelings. She recognizes this by the end of the poem by asking the reader to let her stay on their arm, even if it's just to be around. She doesn't have to talk about her feelings yet. She doesn't feel like she deserves it. She's just a ladybug. Bouncing back to the side story, Trust, Monica brings up the question. Have you ever considered talking to a professional? Sayori nods, saying that it's scary, since it's so hard to tell people in the first place. Monica agrees and says, Well, of course, it'll always be your choice, but if you're ever looking to find the courage for it, I can do my best to help you. And Sayori answers, Thanks, I think it helps knowing that you would. This is super important. 
This is why the side stories mean so much to me. It's the other side of the same coin presented to us in the main game, where we saw mental illness and how it can manifest and what the worst possible outcomes of them can be. With Sayori, that was taking her own life. And the game has something equally as important to say when this happens. There's absolutely nothing you could have done to change this. This isn't some video game where you can restart and try again. Dating sims and visual novels with multiple paths are designed to let you try and try again until you get the right path you were looking for. But there's nothing you can do to save Sayori. The game even, for the first time, takes complete control away from the player when you open her bedroom door by finishing the dialogue box for you. And as soon as it happens, that's it. There's no going back. A storm may invade your mind, telling you all the things you could have said or done differently, but there's nothing to be done and you can't blame yourself. Sometimes people will take their lives, or they'll make some incorrect choices which will lead their lives down a dark path. In those moments after, we have to remind ourselves that we likely did everything we could have done. There are some occasions where we blame ourselves for not doing more, but usually we've done the most that we could with what we had at the time. People with depression typically don't like to voice the extent they're suffering because they feel it doesn't matter, or that things simply cannot get better, so what's the point in talking? There may be things as a society we can do to help prevent things like this in the future, like educating ourselves and others about mental health, encouraging our peers to find professional help, and learning how to communicate our thoughts and feelings to better understand one another like the side story show. But the most important thing of all, and I hope that I've made this clear, Sayori is more than just this. She's more than her depression. She's her own person with quirks, hobbies, wants, and needs. And I think she makes it obvious how important it is that we recognize that. Earlier in this video, I had asked you to comment below all the things you love about Sayori. I want you to take a second to do that if you haven't already, and then take a look at what you wrote. Take a moment to read all the nice things people had to say about her. That's who Sayori is. That's how she wants to be remembered. And that's why Sayori matters. Thank you so much for watching. It's at this point that I'd like to thank all my patrons, but especially Eggdog, Tim, and Raiden. Thank you guys so much for the support. Shoutouts to my Discord art community who made this awesome art of Sayori I'm showing now. If you want your art showcased in the next video, then make sure you join. We host art, music, and writing events all the time in there. Speaking of which, if you want to see who the next video is on, then maybe scroll back through this video to see if you can get some hints. And if you want to see the next video early, along with a making of this video and more to come later, then make sure you join the Patreon. It really helps support the channel. Thank you to Black Roses who did an amazing job voicing Sayori. Her links will be in the description below. And lastly, thank you to Dan Salvato and Serenity Forge for bringing this to life. Until next time, sayonara.